Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In this presentation, we're going to discuss the anatomy of the maxillary premolars are oftentimes called bicuspids. Our objectives in this presentation are to discuss the location and position of these teeth. We'd like to go through the occlusion or the biting and functioning of these teeth. We want to discuss the morphology. We've got a lot of new terminology to define. And we want to discuss the identifying characteristics in these teeth. We have two maxillary premolars in each quadrant. Actually, the mouth can be divided into quadrants. We have, but we have 32 teeth, eight of which make up a quadrant. So we'd have one through eight in one quadrant. This would be our maxillary right quadrant. And then nine through 16 in our maxillary left quadrant. And similarly on the lower. And occasionally you'll see and here of the teeth being divided into quadrants, and that's how they're dividing them. But in our maxillary right quadrant, we have two premolars, as we do in each of the quadrants, and these would be teeth number four and five, or if we wanted to call them by their complete name, maxillary right second premolar, maxillary right first premolar, which gets to be a little bit of a larger mouthful. And our left quadrant uh, has the same identical two teeth. So we're involved with four maxillary premolars located just posterior to our cuspid teeth and just anterior to our molars. And these are usually part of the posterior teeth. The molars and the premolars make up the posterior teeth. Used basically for grinding and chewing they're kind of in between the cuspid, which is a piercing and tearing type tooth, and the molars, which are primarily grinder type. And we do pick up some definite chewing and grinding with these teeth. One of the things we should notice specifically on our skull here is how these teeth interrelate, not only to each other contact-wise, but uh, occlusion-wise also. We'll notice that our mandibular premolars are a half of cusp anterior to the maxillary premolars. This we picked up, remember we indicated basically from the smaller incisors to begin with, seem to, and even a narrower cuspid here, have helped to get our mandibular teeth a half of cusp forward to the maxillary teeth. So that when we go into excursions laterally, these cusps will match and come right out in between the cusps of the upper maxillary teeth here. So we've got a better uh, gear type of function here. We'll also notice that our maxillary premolars are located buccal to the mandibular. This was true in the anterior and it's also true throughout the posterior. With our buccal cusps of our mandibular premolars, actually occluding right into the central groove of our maxillary premolars. Let's look at the anatomy of our individual teeth. First of all, we want to look at a maxillary first premolar. And to begin with, we have to identify the tooth. I think the most obvious thing on the tooth is the simple fact that we've got two cusps on it. It's called a bicuspid or a two-cusp tooth. That's the first thing in identifying. We've only got four of them in the mouth, so we have it limited from 32 teeth down to four teeth right there. The thing that identifies this further is the fact that on one surface of the tooth here, being the mesial surface, we have a rather significant depression or concavity on the mesial surface of this tooth. And this identifies it as a maxillary first. So those two characteristics alone will identify our tooth probably one of the easiest teeth in the mouth to define, to identify. We want to identify surfaces on this tooth also, and 
the simplest way, of course, is with our mesial concavity. This is always on the mesial, so we know that we have a mesial surface here. And then we have to define our buccal and lingual surfaces. And we have two cusps on this tooth, one of them being significantly larger than the other. And again, we can probably see it in this dimension here. And our large cusp is on the buccal. So we've got our mesial and buccal surfaces identified, again, with simply two characteristics. So we're identifying a tooth with two characteristics, one, two cusps, second characteristic, mesial concavity. We identify our surfaces, therefore our right and left tooth, simply by two characteristics, mesial concavity and our largest cusp on the tooth. Actually, I've frequently said that this tooth is probably the easiest tooth in the mouth to identify and probably could be identified blindfolded. If you had a tooth blind in your hand and you had two cusps on it, one larger than the other, and a depression down one surface, then you'd know which tooth it was, maxillary first, premolar, with a mesial surface on it. So it is one that can be developed or identified, actually blindfolded. It's one that, for some reason or other, causes a great deal of difficulty in our later dental school years in uh, identifying, and it uh, is difficult for me to understand. Well, we look to our large tooth here. We've got an enlarged model, and we'll start to identify these surfaces more specifically. We had indicated that our uh, large cusp was our buccal surface, and this is called a, a labial in the anterior, and it's called a uh, facial throughout. So here we're identifying it as buccal surface, although it can be called facial surface in a posterior teeth. It can be called facial or buccal. Our mesial surface is the one with our rather significant concavity in it and uh, quite easy to identify from that standpoint. We've got the distal surface, which is the opposite of the mesial, the lingual surface, the opposite of the buccal. And on our what used to be our incisal surface, surface number five, we're now calling this our clusal surface in all the posterior teeth. But this also, in the way of review here, gives us our line angles and point angles to identify on these teeth. And probably our two buccal line angles are the sharpest line angles of anywhere in the mouth. They're very sharp on the buccal surface. And here we would have our mesial buccal line angle, we should say mesial buccal line angle, and on the distal we have our distal buccal line angle. And this also is the same on the lingual surfaces, although they're not quite as sharply prominent. We have the same two line angles here. If we look to our point angles, again, we're coming up with probably the sharpest point angles of any tooth in the mouth. We rub our line angle off, and our point angle is, is our three surface junction. Here we would have our mesial, buccal, occlusal point angle. And the same on our distal surface. Again, very sharp here. Distal, buccal, occlusal point angle. And the same would exist on our lingual surfaces, although again, they would not be quite as prominently pointed out, but would be in that general area here. All right, we want to go to discussing some of our occlusal anatomy. And to start with, let's just take our outline form. This is frequently said to be hexagonal, referring to our buccal surfaces as two surfaces. One surface here and another surface here, and our mesial and mesial over here, our distal and our lingual surface. This varies from the shape of some of the other ones, but it's generally called hexagonal. I call it egg-shaped or with very broad, sharp corners. Sometimes these will be referred to as shoulders, but it's a, uh, not a technical term. This tooth actually is the widest across through our buccal point angles. And if we were to, uh, well, let's take an individual tooth here. 
we go back to an individual tooth where I think we can see some of these in the, our outline form. If we were to take our Boley gauge and lay this on our tooth here, we would find that uh, it contacts right through the buckle point angles. And this is in the buckle third of the tooth is our widest portion. The tooth tapers uh, significantly as it comes to the lingual. And if you can note on the lingual, one of our lingual line angles is more, well, I'll say more rounded, is, is rounder than uh, the other lingual line angle. And this is a characteristic. This is our distal lingual line angle. Distal lingual line angle. You want to remember to get those O's when you're combining these terms here. Distal lingual line angle right here is more rounded than the uh, mesial lingual line angle. And this is uh, one of the prominent characteristics on these teeth. Actually, when we were talking about the anterior teeth, we were talking about a uh, width in our centrals, which was about two millimeters wider from the mesial to the distal than what we were buccolingually. When we come to our maxillary lateral, we're talking about uh, about a half millimeter wider mesial distally than we were buccolingually. When we get to our cuspids, our cuspids are starting to go the other way. We're a little wider from the uh, labial, and that would be on a cuspid, to the lingual by about a half a millimeter. And when we come to our premolars here, now we're about two millimeters wider from the buccal to the lingual than we are mesial distally. So we really changed uh, dimensions quite significantly. And here we average about seven millimeters from the mesial to the distal on this tooth, and about nine on an average from the buccal to the lingual. So we're about two millimeters wider buccal lingually than we are mesially distally on this tooth. Well, let's start identifying some of the individual characteristics on these teeth. And we can start out with our cusps. With our two cusp tooth, each of the cusps have a name. And these are simply by the surfaces in which they're located. We have a lot of new terminology on this occlusal surface, but I think you'll find for the majority of it, most of it is directly related until the surface in which it is uh, closely located. Our cusp on the buccal is simply called a buccal cusp. Cusp power on the lingual portion of the tooth, simply a lingual cusp. Then we have our associated cusp ridges. One reason why we wanted to identify uh, mesial from distal and buccal from lingual on this to begin with is most of the, this terminology refers to it. We have a buccal cusp ridge, which is actually the whole ridge from our mesial buccal occlusal point angle over to our distal buccal occlusal point angle. This can be divided down into two sections. We can refer to our uh, mesial buccal cusp ridge and to our distal buccal cusp ridge. Or as I said, the whole thing can just be referred to as a buccal cusp ridge. Same thing occurs on the lingual. We got our lingual cusp and our lingual cusp ridge, and it divided down into a mesial lingual cusp ridge and a distal lingual cusp ridge. This leaves us with some ridges along the mesial and distal. And remember what we call these ridges that were connecting up the buccal to lingual and the anteriors? There are marginal ridges. We've got a mesial marginal ridge and a distal marginal ridge. Our mesial marginal ridge usually has a characteristic groove which crosses it. Mesial marginal groove, and this sometimes can be seen in the outline form because it'll actually crease right down onto the mesial surface. This is a very important anatomical landmark which we'll point out again when we look to some natural teeth. This kind of gives us an outline to this tooth, and when we're chewing or functioning on it, our tooth, our food is either deflected to the exterior of the tooth, or it's deflected into the interior of the tooth, kind of referred to as a continental divide, and actually it is outlining what is technically termed occlusal table. This occlusal table is said to be somewhat trapezoidal on this tooth, in so much as it does narrow as it goes to the lingual here quite significantly.
But this is our occlusal table, the area of the inner inclines of our, between our cusps and marginal ridges. We've got some other terms we can identify on here, landmarks. We've got a rather prominent ridge down this buccal surface. And this has a specific term. It's referred to as our buccal ridge. And actually, we're developing from three different areas on our buccal surface. We have uh, three areas of formation out here. And sometimes this will give a little bit of a depression in between on these maxillary first premolars. And we'll develop uh, little concavities or depressions out on this buccal surface. And if you get your tooth located just right, frequently you can see them. The mesial depression here, mesial buccal depression, is much uh, more prominent. Uh, these aren't given specific terms. In our anterior teeth, we had these labeled very specific terms, but I haven't seen any text that gives them specific terms. But if we were to say a, a mesial buccal depression, I think you would recognize what uh, we are talking about from these three developmental lobes that are occurring on the buccal uh, surface. Now, on the lingual, this is like developing from the cingulum on the anterior tooth. This is a single growth center. And we haven't got any developmental type of uh, depressions or grooves that occur on the lingual surface at all. If we come across our buccal cusp and into our occlusal surface or our occlusal table area, we have a lot of new terms in this occlusal table. And probably one of the most prominent ones is this prominent ridge that extends right from our uh, buccal cusp to the central area of our tooth. And this is called our buccal triangular ridge. This triangular ridge occurs both on the buccal as well as on the lingual. From the tip of the lingual cusp to the center of the tooth here, we have a lingual triangular ridge. So and as we go to the posterior teeth, we'll have more triangular ridges as we pick up more cusps in our molars. Both of these triangular ridges end in what is called a central groove. This is a groove which extends from one from the mesial of our occlusal table to the distal of our occlusal table. In our first premolar, the central groove is a long groove. I'll try to mark it out for you. It extends from our mesial pit to our distal pit. It's our central groove. From our central groove area, we develop fossas. We have a fossa on the mesial, which is really kind of outlined from our triangular ridges and our marginal ridges and our cusp ridges. And we have a mesial fossa, a general depressed area in the mesial portion of this tooth. We also have a distal fossa. Sometimes these are called triangular fossas in so much as they have a tendency to apex or point out in certain points down in here. And these points are actually pits. And we have a mesial pit down in the, right at the end of our central groove in the mesial, and this is more or less the apex of our mesial triangular fossa. It's just this one pit area here. And then in the distal, we have a distal pit, which is the apex of our distal fossa, or just a triangular fossa. Frequently, they don't use the word triangular in uh, uh, normal terminology, but it's a technical word for it, and you'll see it in some of the literature. They'll say a, a distal triangular fossa. Distal fossa really has about the same uh, meaning, and either one of them can be used in conversation. We have a number of grooves which extend from our pits, and these all have terms. Actually, we have six grooves on this tooth which have uh, specific names which we'll want to identify. Two of them we already have, our central groove extending from our mesial pit to our distal pit now. We have our mesial marginal groove, which extends out over our mesial marginal ridge and apexes or ends in our mesial pit. And then we have two other grooves coming into this mesial pit. One from the buccal. This is called a mesial buccal groove. It could be called a mesial buccal occlusal groove. There isn't any other occlusal groove with that term, but this is sometimes the technical term for it sometimes called a mesial buccal occlusal developmental groove. 
but for general purposes we just call it a mesial buccal groove and the same is occurring over on the mesial lingual not quite as sharply distinct but frequently a significant depression which is occurring here and this would be our mesial lingual groove so we have four grooves which end up in our mesial pit here central groove mesial marginal groove mesial buccal groove and our mesial lingual groove in our distal pit, we have three grooves. Our central groove, of course, and our distal buccal groove, which is really the longest and most prominent groove outside of our central groove on this tooth, and a distal lingual groove. So this gives us a uh, specific name to these grooves. We've got one other specific occlusal characteristic on this that I should point out, and this is our buccal cusp ridge. Our buccal cusp ridge is straight line on this tooth as it extends from our two point angles, but this line is not parallel to our central groove, and our central groove is more or less at right angles to the width of the tooth from the buccal to the lingual. Our buccal cusp is not. It has a tendency to be what we call tangential. I think the textbook calls it a mesial lingual oriented direction. But it comes much closer to the central groove at the mesial than it does the distal. And you can think of this in a couple ways. First of all, this tooth is becoming wider as we're going posterior and it's widening out from our narrow contact with our cuspid up here on the mesial to a broader contact with a, a bicuspid uh, posterior here. We have a situation where we've got a rather significant depression on uh, the buccal surface out here, which kind of pushes this marginal ridge in on the mesial, whereas on the distal we've got a very long groove that extends out from the occlusal. So this is really kind of twist the buccal cusp ridge on this crown so that it's twisted. And this is a very significant characteristic and a very easy characteristic to pick up and use for identification on this tooth. If we were to look to the mesial outline on this tooth, let me get the mesial surface here, we would find several characteristics which we'd want to point out. Generally the crown is located directly over the center of the root. I make a note of this because our mandibular teeth are not this way, but this is generally located right over the center of the root. And our buccal cusp is the highest cusp on it. It's the furthest from the cervical. When I say highest, I guess it depends on the location in which you're holding it, uh, whether it's up in the mouth or as we have it in our hand here. But it's the furthest from the cervical. It's the tallest cusp in the crown. Our lingual cusp is a smaller or shorter cusp, closer to the cervical. Our central groove actually is right in the center of the tooth. And our tooth kind of divides down into quarters. We divide it in half through this central groove, and we can divide it in quarters as we come through our cusp, because our cusps are generally over about the quarter of the tooth. Actually, this whole depression that occurs in between our two cusps here is frequently called a sulcus, and we could refer to this depression that uh, occurs through here as a central sulcus. This refers to the entire valley. A, a sulcus is a valley-shaped depression that occurs around a groove, and this area here, our central groove. So we've got a central sulcus through this tooth, which is the, the whole depression, a term which is not commonly used, but occasionally you'll uh, find note of. In our outline form here from the mesial, we've also uh, can note that we've got our mesial marginal groove, which extends over our mesial marginal ridge and onto our mesial surface a little bit. Our contact area is generally towards the buckle here a little bit, out in the buckle third of the tooth. Our tooth narrows considerably to the lingual. And then we have this large concavity that occurs down on this tooth. And this is a very significant concavity, and it actually extends into the crown up close to our height of contour and our contact area. 
And this has many terms. When it, uh, can, generally, it's just referred to as a concavity or a depression. Uh, it, you can refer to it as a groove. Specifically, the book identifies the depression that occurs up in the ground or up in the crown here as a mesial concavity. And as it extends down into the root, it is referred to as a mesial inner radicular groove. Now, this groove can occur in some areas down onto the root, but our mesial concavity, the portion that is actually into the crown, is uh, only in the mesial of our maxillary first premolars. Uh, frequently, this whole concavity is referred to as a mesial concavity. It can be referred to as a, a uh, mesial proximal depression or a, just a root depression or a root concavity or a proximal root concavity. Or it has many terms. A proximal, of course, meaning a uh, in surface in between. This is our proximal surface here. Mesial surface and distal surfaces are always proximal surfaces, so we can call it a proximal root depression or a proximal depression. Or It has many terms which are used there. We should identify our height of contours on this. This tooth has got a little different height of contours in so much as our height of contour on the buckle is in the cervical third of the tooth. On the lingual, we're usually in the middle third of the tooth. On our lingual surface, we usually have a fairly even, smooth convexity, which occurs from the cervical up to our lingual cusp, with our widest point being in the middle third. This is the first time it's come up into the middle third of our tooth, and is, should be pointed out significantly here. Actually, our root structure uh, varies quite widely on these teeth, and we can have several different root forms. Our most common root form is a what's called a bifurcated root, in which we have two roots. I'd say uh, I haven't seen any statistics on this, but I think probably two-thirds or more of the teeth uh, are bifurcated. When we say bifurcated, we're referring to two roots on these teeth. And we've got some terms on this root structure that are new, and we want to uh, inject in here. Actually, the point at which these roots separate, which would be right here, is called a bifurcation. The area of the tooth between the bifurcation and the cervical line is called a root trunk. The area between the bifurcation and the cervical line is a root trunk. And that leaves us two specific roots on these teeth. And again, they're just called by the surface in which they are nearest to. We have a buccal root and a lingual root. Again, our buccal root usually being a little bit more prominent than the lingual root. And then, of course, our concavity, which extends actually into this inner radicular groove and goes right into our bifurcation area. I'd say a, oh, maybe a third of these teeth are single-rooted teeth. Uh, and have basically the same uh, anatomy with the exception of the splitting or bifurcating of the roots. You can't really identify them whether they're single or two-rooted teeth because they, they vary so widely. Occasionally we'll even have teeth which will become three-rooted, in which we'll pick up two roots on the buccal surface. This is not real common, but this will happen occasionally. When we get to uh, the terminology on these teeth, as far as the root names and what have you, we'll go into this further when we get to our maxillary molars, because this is basically the structure of our maxillary molars is a three-rooted teeth. should point out one other thing, too, and that is that this bifurcation area is sometimes uh, abbreviated by some people as a furcation. They just leave the bi off. Uh, and they call it just a, a furcation area. Let's take a distal view of these teeth. And we'll go back to our enlarged model on it. When we're looking at the distal, we no longer see a groove coming across the marginal ridge here. We have a, a smooth surface. Our contact area, again, is located out towards the buckle, but not usually quite as far buckly as on the mesial. Uh, 
mesial, we're contacting a cuspid. Here we're starting to contact another bicuspid, but it's still in the buccal third of the tooth, and we narrow down significantly as we come lingually here. Our marginal ridge is not is closer to the cervical. I was going to say not as high or as low, but we got to try to get rid of those terms in our discussions. It is closer to the cervical and not as prominent. It dips further from the cusp tips as it uh, comes around the distal. Actually, it's got a little further to go, and uh, it's dipping towards the cervical here. So sometimes we can see a little bit more of the anatomy when we're looking at it from the distal. Should point out another thing, and that is our cervical line. In our anterior teeth, we had a rather significant curvature to our cervical line. Uh, and with our premolars here now, we're not having a significant curvature on the cervical line, either the mesial or the distal. It's relatively uh, straight across on our cervical line. Occasionally, if we've got a bifurcated tooth, we may have a little extension of enamel that'll actually come down right in the area where our root is uh, grooving or starting to uh, bifurcate. If we were to look at our buccal view of these teeth, we'd find that, uh, well, let's get it in anatomical position here now. Our buccal view is very similar to that of our cuspid. We haven't got a large difference here. Get some of our pencil wiped off here. Very similar to our cuspid. So one thing we don't see that is more common in the cuspid is a, a much longer distal buccal cusp ridge. Our mesial buccal and distal buccal cusp ridges are really pretty close the same length. This mesial buccal cusp ridge may be slightly shorter than the distal, but it's very hard to differentiate. We've got uh, the heights of contours on our mesial and distal, which are very close to the occlusal surface uh, and are quite symmetrical as far as the mesial and distal. Might be just a little lower on the a little closer to the cervical on the distal, but uh, they're very, both of them are in the occlusal third. The tooth tapers quite sharply and becomes quite narrow on the root structure, and you'll notice that our root structure, like our premolars, is narrow from the mesial to the distal. Very narrow, and we got a sharp tapering of our crown. And then we end up with a rather broad labial lingual, or here we're talking about buccal lingual now, buccal lingual uh, root structure. Our cusp is generally pretty well centrally located over our root on our buccal uh, outline form here. If we look to our lingual surface, we only have one real prominent characteristic on it, and that is our lingual cusp is smaller and the tip of it is located towards the mesial. Probably should have pointed that out in the occlusal view. But our cusp is located towards the mesial. Now again, if we go back to the function of these teeth and how they occlude in the mouth, uh, these cusps will start to what we call interdigitate, or the points and the cusp tips and our marginal ridges uh, mesh almost like gears with our mandibular teeth. And this swings to the mesial so that it falls right onto a marginal ridge of a, a lower tooth. So it really has a, a purpose or function in swinging to the mesial, but it gives us a big help in trying to identify these teeth because our, we know that our lingual cusp is always to the mesial just a little bit. Of course, it's smaller, considerably smaller. When we look at our mesial outline here, we can see the entire outline of our buccal cusp looking at it from the lingual. When we looked at it from the buccal, our entire lingual cusp was uh, uh, not visible. But from the lingual, we can see the entire mesial area of the tooth. Well, now if we look to our second maxillary premolar, we want to look at it in a comparison view here. And we find that our anatomy basically on these are the same. Let's turn it around this direction. That's how we've been looking at several of them here, I guess. But we'll point out the differences mainly in these teeth rather than the number of uh, similarities because we've got the same surfaces, the same uh, uh, line angles, the point angles, the same uh, cusps, the same marginal ridges, the same 
uh, anatomy inside of our occlusal table or on our occlusal table, but there are some significant differences. We'll start right back with our occlusal outline, and I think you can see here that our occlusal outline is different. The tooth is said to be more oval. We have less of a prominence to our buccal line angles and our buccal point angles out on the surface. And our tooth has more of a tendency to become uh, egg-shaped or oval in its entire outline form. We have the same, in, within the same mouth, we have generally the same uh, width, about seven millimeters from the mesial to the distal, and buccal lingually, we're about nine. And within the same mouth, uh, these are almost exactly identical. If we look to our occlusal anatomy, we find several changes which occur, and again, I'll point these out more specifically rather than the similarities. On our second premolar, we do not have a mesial marginal groove. And here I think you can see rather prominently the mesial marginal groove on our first, and our second just simply does not have that. We have a very short central sulcus on these teeth or I should say central groove, actually central sulcus too, but our central groove is very short on these teeth. Fact is, occasionally it'll be so short as to almost end up in a central pit. And here's one here, if we can slide in, that has actually got a little staining in it. You can see it a little bit clearer, possibly. And this is really almost a central pit. The central groove is so short and on occasion, we could refer to our, our central pit or central fossa on these teeth if we just have one central area. But generally, it's referred to as a groove and a very short groove. But we still will have our mesial pit, distal pit, and uh, um, our same basic lines, which are grooves which come out on our occlusal surface. Another prominent characteristic on this is the mesial concavity. On this tooth, we have no mesial concavity. It is simply fairly convex in this area, and this concavity just is not present. Because of our short central groove here, this leaves us rather thick and heavy marginal ridges, which are oftentimes uh, characteristic on it, just because we got a, a short central groove on it. Occasionally, we'll have uh, what is termed supplementary grooves on the occlusal surface of these seconds. And I don't know if I can find a supplementary groove or not. Maybe here's a tooth that shows it uh, a little bit better. Beside our usual grooves on it, occasionally we'll get a secondary groove, such as this groove right along in here which would be a supplementary groove. A supplementary groove is just kind of an extra groove, which is uh, uh, not real sharp, but kind of a depression. And sometimes we'll have some extra supplementary grooves on these teeth. And that's a term that they can be referred to as. Our occlusal table on these teeth is generally, instead of being called trapezoidal, it's called more rectangular, in so much as uh, we haven't got this sharp tapering towards the lingual surface. Also on our uh, buccal cusp ridge, we do not have a flat or a straight buccal cusp ridge. Generally, our buccal cusp ridge is more arced or curved, and it is not closer to the mesial or further out on the distal. It's generally fairly evenly oval on our buccal cusp ridge. And we haven't got this real sharp orientation towards the mesial lingual like we do on the first. Maybe you can see the difference here. We've got a rather straight one here, and it's starting to get marked up, but it's generally more arced or curved on it, and fairly significant uh, uh, difference on our buccal cusp bridges. If we look to some of the outline forms on this, we'll find that uh, if we look at it from the mesial, get some of that wax out, it's starting to get warm there. We'll find that our cusps are much closer in height. Now on our first premolar, we knew that our lingual cusp was significantly shorter than our buccal cusp.
And on our second premolars, our lingual cusp is not as high or not as prominent or as tall as our buccal cusp, but it's almost. It's getting almost of equal size. We generally have a single rooted tooth. They can be two rooted, but they're generally single rooted. And again, you can't uh, identify the tooth by the root structure because they vary. I'd say probably 80, 90 percent of them are uh, single rooted, generally speaking. We have the same heights of contour on these, but we have no mesial marginal ridge, mesial marginal groove, excuse me, coming out on this tooth generally. Occasionally you'll have one, but it's not prominent and not very frequently found, and we have no mesial concavity on this surface. If we go to our other views, we're finding uh, our distal view is almost exactly the same. Our marginal ridge is closer to the cervical, and uh, the same basic uh, heights of contours on them, and there's no real significant difference. If we're looking to our buccal surface, we find that these, well, actually, we might tip it up and uh, look at it, these depressions that occur on the buccal surface of our first premolar are not found on the second premolar. Our second premolar is just uh, oval, and we don't find these buccal depressions or prominencies uh, on the buccal surface here. When we look to our lingual, of course, we're not seeing as much of our buccal cusp simply because we don't have, or we have a much larger uh, lingual cusp on this, although we generally can see a little bit of the buccal outline, but not as much. Again, a very prominent characteristic is our tip of our lingual cusp is closer to the mesial surface. This gives you some of the differences that we have in our second premolar. Uh, just in my mind, uh, not as well defined anatomically. We're just starting to lose a lot of the anatomy. We're starting to round out. We lose our buccal depressions. We get a smaller central groove. We have no mesial marginal groove and no mesial concavity. It's not as sharply defined anatomically, and it's becoming a little bit more uh, oval in total structure on it. But that should give you some prominent characteristics which should help you to identify the uh, first from the second. The only additional new term which we may have in the second would be a supplemental groove, which occasionally occurs towards the central area in our uh, overall central sulcus area here. Let's look at the pulpal morphology on these maxillary premolars. If we look to the maxillary first premolar in a mesial distal section, we find that it's almost identical to that of our maxillary cuspids. Again, we have to keep in mind continuously the external morphology of our roots and crown in order to understand and the pulpal morphology. Here we have a very narrow root from the mesial to the distal, and we have a very narrow pulpal cavity. Not only our pulp chamber, but our root canal. If we were to look at a buccal lingual section, we'd find that we're starting to look different than our cuspid. And we have a very distinctly defined pulp chamber in this area. And this is the area before we start dividing into our canals. And generally speaking, our first maxillary premolar will have two canals, regardless of whether it has one root or two roots. It has two canals in it. Also, we have some very sharply defined pulp horns. And again, we'd have a buccal pulp horn on the buccal surface, and this is basically right under the tip of our buccal cusp. And our buccal cusp is the larger cusp. We would have a larger pulp horn under the buccal cusp area. And we have a lingual pulp horn, which is right under the lingual cusp, not quite as prominent as our buccal pulp horn. When we look to these canals, we find that we have them by name now. We have a buccal root canal and a lingual root canal. Sometimes these can be referred to as pulp canals. The text, I think, refers to them, Krauss, as pulp canals in some places, although the more common uh, 
terminology is root canal uh, meets. If we look to our second maxillary premolar, we find again in a mesial distal section that we're essentially the same. We have a very narrow, long, narrow pulp chamber and root canal. And it's hard to distinguish where one stops and the other starts. But when we look to our buccal lingual section, we find that this is rather distinct at this stage. And you can see the pulp chamber very easily here now. And in this instance, we have two canals within one root. This is what we were speaking of in relation to the first. If our first has one root, it practically always has two canals in it. Actually, our seconds more commonly have one root and one canal, although it can vary. And this is a really a variation. We have one root with two canals. We also could have, you know, two roots with uh, two canals. So we have to be alert to the variations on them, and the variations are reasonably common, and uh, be able to you know, know what to look for in attempting to treat or to work on these teeth. Again, we have the same relationship in our pulp horns. Our pulp horns are usually a little bit closer in uh, size because our cusps are usually a little bit closer in size. If we look at uh, one other section here, we have a actually a first premolar which has been endodontically filled. That is, the pulp has been removed, these canals have been completely cleaned out, and we have a filling material which comes right down to the tip of the root. And once this occurs in the mouth and our tooth is uh, sterilized, usually we'll get healing of any pulpal infection that occurs. But this is a type of treatment, and this is a treated tooth, which I uh, thought I would show you at this time, which shows specifically our maxillary first premolar and a two-rooted, uh, two-canaled tooth here. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.